first and foremost, make sure they can find a way to contact you. Um, so make sure that your website, your Twitter, all of that, that you're very clear about how people can connect with you, how they can contact you. Um, the other thing is just like media, you know, when you're a media site and you have a media kit, you should have a work with me page or a work with me site or a work with me mantra that says, you know, who you want to work with. You know, sort of head it off at the pass, you know, just be very clear about what you're looking for and the partners that you're looking for um, so that, you know, when I see that page, I can think, you know, great, I can work with you. I mean, working at Walmart, there were a lot of moms that didn't want to work with us. And so, you know, if we could have that conversation and be very clear and straightforward in the beginning and save us all a lot of time. I don't mind beating around the bush, you know, or I don't want to beat around the bush, rather. Um, <laughs> um, and so I was always about transparency and honesty. And I've never, I never, as a brand side, never wanted to force a, an influencer to do something that they weren't comfortable with. And on the, on the other side, if you're an influencer, don't do something that's out of your wheelhouse because it's just going to be uncomfortable for, for everyone. So first and foremost, foremost, make it easy for them to contact you and be very clear what it is you're looking for. Make it very, very easy on how to contact you. There's been many times where you try to approach a blogger, but guess what? They don't have their email address on their website. And um, as a blogger, really know what you what you're going for. What do you want? Be very clear on your website too, on that page, and learn how to contact me. I and as you said too, when I do that now for Latina Geeks, because we host a week a monthly Facebook Lives, so we always have to come up with new gadgets to showcase. So I'm going on Facebook, I'm messaging them, but professionally being very upfront, like, hey, this is what I'm doing for this website, this is how you can contact me. Yeah, and I would add that uh, I think it's really important for influencers and brands to align on values, like the core values. For instance, you think about Patagonia, right? They really own the outdoor equipment sustainability conversation. So if that's the kind of person you are, they're really like, there's no other brand for you, right? And, and, and on the brand side, for me, like when I worked with, um, when I was at the LA Marathon, and I wanted to create a television campaign with a bunch of local celebrities and athletes, I went out evangelizing to Kobe Bryant, to Chef Gordon Ramsay, to The Rock, et cetera, about, hey, our mission is to inspire athletes and connect communities. We're trying to make LA a better place. Do you want to help us with that? And immediately, they were all like, okay, where do we sign up? We're in, right? And I just, um, I'm part of a new studio fitness concept that's launching right now, and we just, uh, my partner is friends with a number of celebrities and professional athletes, and we just went and had a dinner with a bunch of them. He was like, Peter, just come with me. I don't really know. I just want to kind of try to build our community. And I had him put the mission statement that we had come up with together. We worked very hard on, on the front of our little kind of deck. And the first thing they did is they looked at it and said, okay, we like your mission statement. And we, when we got into it, I said, look, we're using fitness as a tool to, to, to make our city better. And they're like, oh my God, that's all we talk about. Yes. Right, and so like the next morning at 8 a.m. we get the text from two television actors and a professional athlete that like, okay, we're in, where do we sign, what, can we invest, like, it, and so it was very much a very base level connection based on the core values. I think that focusing around that and being very honest and upfront, I actually had um, a mom blogger who I was, um, it was Rave Bug Spray, <laughs> and she was like, I don't like pesticides, da da da, and I had a conversation with her and I said, Okay, I, I get that, I understand that, but you're standing in your garage and there's, or you're standing in your kitchen, there's a big cockroach, what are you gonna do? She's like, I'm gonna get the right book spray. I said, yeah. So she, I said, that's fine, and have that open and honest communication. And in her blog post, she said, look, I'm a green mom, I'm a clean mom, I'm a safe mom, but I gotta tell you, if there's a big old cockroach standing in my kitchen, like, I'm gonna, I need, I'm gonna get whatever I need to do in order to, to, to kill that, and, uh, you know, so it, it, we were very open and honest about that, but then in that conversation, she said, you know, here are safety tips for keeping bugs spray in a safe place, and, you know, so, um, again, core values, and then also, um, you know, sort of, something might not seem like it makes sense, but then get on the phone and have that conversation, and it probably will. So for you, the example of like finding what makes those athletes and, and those yep. individuals tick and That's the thing right. that is gonna sort of, you know, make sense in their sort of heart, then yep. just go with that angle. Yep. Either go to events, um, you know, there are, you know, Blogger was the catalyst of that, right? That was basically the beginning of it was, let's, you know, provide tools and resources to influencers and I as an agency, was like, I gotta go to these conferences, I gotta meet these people because I'm trying to find these individuals and work with them. And so um, I, 
cannot stress enough, it, despite this digital and social world, how much happens in a, in a conversation over coffee or at a conference or at a lunch or something like that. So it's worth that money to often go to those conferences or those things where the brands are at. Look at their website, see who's going to be there. Go, oh, wow, you know what? This brand's here. And I used to do that as, as you know, on the agency side when I would go to events where clients were at. Same thing, I'm pitching them, right? I'd look at who was attending and I'd, I'd like have my hot list of who I was going to go to. So. Um, you know, when you go to these conferences or events, if they're doing a promotional booth, go to most likely that brand manager is probably there. So go, hey, this thing that you're doing for Haynes is really cool. Like I'm a mom blog talking about, you know, fitness and Haynes Cotton is perfect. And like, who can I talk to about this? What about the MCNs and platforms and different like digital tools or even representation firms? I mean, yeah. Should influencers hitch their wagon to those? Why or why not? I mean, I think you just, it's, you, you have to look at the agreement and you have to look at it. Oftentimes, you know, I, I was speaking with an individual the other day who um, sells videos online, um, to, like tutorial videos, and he went on a new business venture and he's making, he made a movie and he was trying to get distribution. And we were chatting and he, he I, I said, yeah, you know, there's a lot of companies out there like Full Screen and Maker Studios. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I have a contract with Full Screen. And I just went, uh, Wait, why haven't you called them up? <laughs> like, why aren't you called? You're, they're repping you. Um, you know, coming from the entertainment space and having a lot of um, friends that, that and, and connections that are in that space is, they're not gonna always work for you 100%. You have to constantly stay in contact, make sure that they are working for you or keeping them posted, because you're one of many in a lot of those situations. So just know that even if you do hit your wagon to these guys, that sometimes you're still gonna have to work to, to make it happen for you as well. Um, and just, you know, I would definitely, if you're gonna sign a contract or a deal, get get a lawyer involved or, you know, pay, pay the money to kind of have somebody explain it to you because there's a lot that's hidden in those contracts and in those things. Um, you know, uh, be clear about what they own and, and what they're taking and what they have the rights to. Um, because the other thing is, as influencers and as content creators, your your worth is your content, right? So um, definitely, you know, yes, there are fantastic opportunities, but you also just need to be very smart about it. And on the brand side, I'm always looking for um, influencers who are great content creators that I can co-create with or piggyback onto their tribe and their content. And I think if you're out there creating compelling content, whether it's a blog, whether you're speaking, whether it's experiential, whether it's video, social, whatever it is, if you're creating compelling content and building a tribe around that content and you really have a strong point of view and a direction, you're going to attract brands into your ecosystem. So I think that's super important to, like, every person and every brand is a media company now. So it's really important to get out there and start creating. Everyone's watching, too. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking at content in the trucking industry for our clients and the range of kind of user generated, it's all user generated, but the range is very wide in terms of the, the quality and I'm gravitating to the, you know, the YouTubers that have, you know, have six you know, GoPros on their truck and they're, you know, doing yeah. some cool editing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing too is just be really smart about what, out, what else is out there and what other people are doing. I'm just saying this earlier, like, look at your competitors. I would say from the brand side, they see that as yeah. well. So they, that's yeah. a, a mental note of yeah. who not to work with. Yeah. So it's really important to, as the, the inf influencer and the blogger, to really define what you're all about and what you want to represent. I mean, it's like good old-fashioned branding. Yeah, to me, I think this all comes back to, from an influencer perspective, understanding, and I think, Peter, you started to talk about it a little bit earlier, um, your own brand's personality and who you are. You, know, you have to see yourself as a brand. Ultimately, you are your own brand. As a blogger, it's really great to network in these private, what you think is private Facebook groups. And I say that because a lot of the people that are pitching to you are in the industry as well. So they're, you know, they're receiving pitches like I am. And we also belong to those groups too. So it's a matter of being professional online and not bad mouthing these agencies that you're working with. Um, because it can affect your opportunity for a, a campaign. Not to mention people agency hop left and right, so you never know when one person at one job is that. That's something you said about like the money and the fame versus the authenticity. I mean, it makes me wonder, uh, 
you know, does the do audience our audiences gonna always put up with influence or marketing? Like I'm thinking of the relationship to the audience on one hand, and then like is there this arc in the data that could show us that you want to get an influencer right on their way up and not well, too late. The FTC actually just recently passed a rule now um, to address that, that when someone is actually getting paid to be um, representing something, that that actually somewhere needs to be communicated. So This is they did with native ads. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I would say that the answer is no, that, you know, um, I think people are, are very much aware, you know, and that this is definitely like a new space and it's definitely going to have to, I mean, it's already from an FTC perspective, starting to see more controls so that people understand when someone's getting paid for it. The audience right now that I'm totally focused on is teen girls because they like, they're, they're the majority of the audience online, like they're the, the, um, they're the ones that are, that are joining the platforms first and exploring them. They also have like a lot of purchasing power. And so, you know, they're the ones that are really spearheading this sort of consumer shift and behavioral change. And the way that we, and I was having this conversation the other day, we used to think online, offline, right? Like I'm online or I'm offline. But they don't think that way. They don't think I'm in Facebook and now I'm on a website and now I'm on an app. They don't think that way. And it's the same goes for the Kardashians of the world. They don't think Kim Kardashian is just posting a picture out with her family or Kim Kardashian is posting a picture of green tea that she's sponsoring. Like, you know, it's just, I think that it's just an inherent understanding. But what that teen girl is going to look at is, Am I interested in what this person is posting? Do, do I want to retweet it? Do I want to repost it? Do I want to hear what they have to say? So, you know, they are savvy in the sense of um, there's the differentiation doesn't need to be there, whether it's promoted, not promoted, online, offline, whatever, that's not there. But what they are going to attack and, and sort of pull out is whether or not it's authentic. It makes sense to them if they like it or they don't like it. Like, it's either you love it or you don't, and that's it. That's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would add that, like, I, I'll, from the brand side, when I'm, I'm kind of building relationships with influencers, I always prefer uh, people who are actually doing real things, whether they're an athlete, a chef, a uh, filmmaker, uh, an artist, whatever it is, people who are really doing something real rather than like, no, I kind of got to try here, I've kind of gained the system and I'll sell it to you, like that's not, that's really not interesting to me. Somebody who's really actually out there doing something is really interesting to me. And so then, then they don't, hopefully they don't really cross the line into, I'm an influencer, they're, they're an artist, they're an athlete, is what they are. It's their story. It's their story. It's the, it's the totally. story. Like, if you don't have a story, if you're like, no, but I just post a lot of pictures of me looking really hot in a bikini, that's not a story. Do you think influencers are made or are, there, are they born? No. Where are they, I mean, is, are you just naturally no. an influencer or do you, can you actually, like, say, I'm going to go do this because everybody's making money at it? I think it's both. I mean, I, I think you're born with a certain kind of personality, but at the same time, you can really learn a lot. My probably favorite influencer that I see out there right now who I think is really amazing is Ken Block, who was formerly the president of DC Shoes, built that from nothing. He went to my high school, and I did his first television commercial when I had a production company. He sold that to Quicksilver, and then he reinvented himself as a professional rally car driver, and he made rally car driving cool around the world. His Gymkhana videos have over 100 million views on YouTube. He has massive brand deals with Ford, with Monster Energy Drink. His Instagram game is unbelievable. He is so good because he was formerly a CEO. And if you met him, meet him in person, he's really not charismatic at all. He's kind of goofy. He's not great looking, he, but he's so smart at kind of a street level vibe because he lived in the skate world for many years. And he, he just runs circles around most other professional athletes. And he's extraordinary. I think it also depends on how you define influencer marketing, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it really is just word of mouth discussion. So, you know, are we talking, you know, it's how do we define it is, is you know, sort of, sort of interesting. You know, are we talking about these people that have, you know, thousands and thousands of followers? I mean, an influencer could be someone that just in their... You know, it could be a mom that has a circle of friends that's super passionate about, you know, a particular product um, and influences them to sort of all get on board. You know, I mean, 
it, you know, I myself, you know, when I when I love a product, you know, go to my girlfriends and say, oh my god, you know, you've got to try this new lipstick. You know, I mean, that's that's a form of influencing. Yeah. So, it's all of the above. I think it's it's I, a very broad category. Absolutely. All of those things. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned an influencer that you respect and that you follow. Do you guys uh, also have ones that you like right now or that you have a lot of respect for? I don't, I follow everyone from like celebrities to my friends to, you know, all sorts of stuff and uh, I, I can be persuaded either way, you know, I, I like I've used, you know, a, a product because I saw a celebrity in a magazine do an interview on it and I'm going, man, she's really great screen, she looks really young, so I think I'm going to try it out. But then I also have been in like a Facebook group, and now I have like an amazing personal trainer that just because they had one degree of connection, it was, a, you know, her, the connection came from a girl that I met in swing class, and I was like, oh, she's really nice, and I bet you, like, if she's recommending this person, she's really nice and cool and not going to be like a boot camp guy. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, the, the degree of influence completely you know, can vary, and it's, there's no longer this division or this line, you know, like, you're an influencer, you're not an influencer, like, we're all influencers in our own way, and it, as a brand, you, you just, you're trying to find a smart way to go about that. I also think that you, you shouldn't put all your eggs in the, like, you know, influencer with a million views basket, so don't get discouraged if you're a smaller influencer. I mean, the other day I had somebody go, oh my god, you have a thousand people on Twitter? And I was like, and he's like, wow, it's crazy, I have 50. And I didn't think about that, I was like, oh. Right, I agree, and, and I, I think of it, how I like to think of it is, I don't really even think in terms of influencers with brands, I think in terms of relationships, right? And you have relationships at many different levels, from an individual customer to a pay, highly paid professional, whoever it is, and everything in between. And I, I, I think the strongest brands have really strong relationships with their tribe, they really build a tribe. And the, the, when a brand has strong guardrails and they know what they stand for, it's very easy for a customer to go, yeah, not my brand, which is great. Every, every good brand needs guardrails, right? And the same with, um, you know, you just think of the brands you like, they relate to you on a certain level, on certain channels, and, and you share values. So for instance, with Lululemon, when we're first meeting with influencers, we go in and we go, we just listen. And we go, hey, how can we help you? And like the, the, our point of view is, what can we do for you, right? Oh, like so for instance, you, Lululemon has hundreds, maybe thousands of like relationships with yoga teachers around the world and have had for 20 years. They go to the yoga, the yoga teachers in general are not paid, but they go to the yoga teachers, they go, how can we help? Like, oh, it sounds like you've got you, this group here, you guys need leadership training. You need maybe financial management. You need help building your brand. Oh, we have some channels, we can help you do that, right? And so we start that way. And I, I had a meeting um, last year with a professional runner who came in and he just went, I can't believe this. I've never had a brand speak to me this way before. Like I, I, I can't even. This is wow. This is amazing. And and um, so I, I always think if you're, I believe if you're on the influencer side, you should be going to brands and going, what can I do for you? And I believe if you're on the brand side, you should be going to influencers and what can we do for you? And I believe really strongly in the concept of bringing value first before you ask for something in return on kind of both sides. I would say that too, is if you're the influencer, you really need to think about that relationship as a long-term relationship. It's not just campaign specific. Because like you said, who knows? That person that you're interacting with could be at an agency six months later and they're going to remember right. your email comment. Or um, I've had uh, bloggers try to bite my head off before, uh, kind of snappy, but um, you know, it's, it's noted and it's like, okay, well, won't be part of that campaign any, anymore. Or not going to pitch you. So long term. Yeah, the best influencers that we've partnered with are ones that do consider it long term mm -hmm. and are willing to partner with the brand to come up with content that is going to be over an extended period of time. Because ultimately, when somebody's going to make a, a purchasing decision of any kind, typically they need a more than one touch point. So, you know, just simply doing like one post about it isn't really going to get a brand too much influence. So, you know, the, the, the influencers that we've partnered with that understand this and are really willing to truly partner it, to really consider a long term relationship and help partner together to come up with, you know, basically like a campaign strategy for themselves and how they can, 
you know, multiple times come up with, I'm gonna do an email here, and then I'm gonna do a blog post here, and then I'll do a video a little bit later, and come up with almost a sort of tactical plan for themselves, um, are the ones that ultimately have been most successful. It's all about co-creation. Um, you know, I used to get on the phone, um, you know, back in the day, and have a conversation and say, what's going on in your world? What are you promoting? Like how, you know, and a lot of uh, bloggers and influencers have their do's and don'ts, like we were saying earlier, you know, things you'll do, things you won't do. And be very clear about that and upfront. But then as I'm chatting with them, it kind of opened opportunities and ideas for myself. Um, in this digital and social world, even on, you know, companies and agencies, I find everyone's like in front of their laptop, working away, and like gone are the days of just like sitting in a room and brainstorming. Doesn't matter what level you're at or where you come from, like two brains is better than one. Um, and, you know, now you're seeing the automation of these influencer relationships, which are, brings back to the idea of like joining some of these platforms or things like that. But be weary of the automation because then you lose the authenticity. So again, the, the, get on the phone with the person and have a conversation and, and maybe suggest that, you know, keep in mind that coming from the brand side or the agency side, we've got a lot going on. Which there's probably many elements of the campaign that we're running. This is just one portion of it. Um, so be proactive in saying, hey, do you mind, can you hop on the phone for 15 minutes, maybe have a discussion, and we can kind of brainstorm some ideas. Um, and like a good brand manager or a good agency person is going to totally welcome that and relish that. So. Is there a, an architecture for that process or for co-creation? Like a best practice of kind of how you march through that and where the, the brand and the influencer meet in the middle to create content, or is it more organic than that? I, I have a process in which, so for, for me, from an, coming from an agency perspective, um, typically I like to have the influencer come with, you know, their press kit or their basically information of who their followers are and a little bit of, you know, some like a one sheet bullet pointed thing just to be able to kind of talk to the brand a little bit about here's what my brand represents, this is what I know to be true about my audience, this is what that's going to resonate with them as far as content's concerned. And then the brand should be doing the same thing where the brand comes up with a bullet pointed, very short sort of here's what our goals are, here's what our objectives are and what we're trying to accomplish. Here's what differentiates us from the competition out there and what our unique selling uh, selling points are related to our message and what we're trying to accomplish right now. And here's what we're trying to complicate, you know, communicate in terms of brand voice. How can we together, you know, figure this out? And then that's real so so that both of both parties can be able to walk away with a true understanding of what each brings to the table, and that's where you can then start to go from there in terms of, you know, uh, creation of content. Yeah, you know, I just, two years ago, I was working with um, NCSA. It's the biggest college sports re athletic recruiting service in the country. So it's like Match.com for with high, uh, high school athletes on one side and college coaches and their roster spots on the other. And um, I built a relationship with these uh, four girls called the Package Deal. They're sort of like the most popular softball players in the country, fast pitch. They're 28 years old. They travel around the country like a band, right? Giving softball clinics, but they've really big followings on social. And if you're in that niche, they're famous, right? So they came to the office and we sat, uh, first of all, I met with them. And they said, okay, don't go any further. We're about helping teenage girls. Are you, is that, are you into that? Term? Like, totally. They go, okay, great, we can keep talking. Then they came to our office in Chicago and we sat down and went, okay, so we're trying to sell families this service that helps them find college spots for their student athlete uh, kids. You guys are out talking to thousands of high school athletes every year, how can we align? They're like, uh, so it's like, okay, well, what do you have? They're like, okay, well, we have live um, events every week all over the country. We have these social channels. We love to make video content. We have a blog. And they're like, what do you have? I'm like, okay, we've got big social channels. We have budgets that we can put behind, like, let's create some video content together. We can make collateral for you. We can help make your events better. At, and, and you can come speak at our events, which will help us, but it'll help your brand. We can help build your brand. And so we start aligning on things, common areas of common ground and alignment. So we're moving in the same direction, rather than like 
well, I do this and you do that. Like, that never works. It's always good. So that back to relationship. Right, and things, things that are a win-win, like we're building our brand and your brand all together. It's all working at once. Yeah. I would say agencies are creating their own networks nowadays. So in order to join the network, you have to fill out a form, and then there's all your data, so you know what to invite them to, and then you get to know them, and there goes the process. It kind of makes everything a lot easier from the old spreadsheets. Yeah, like in the day. Databases are, are, are really are really big and, and and everyone's trying to automate it and um, you know there are platforms out there so make sure that you're on them you know um, things like Group High and, and you know other it was essentially it's just a database system so kind of go out there and, and, and make sure that you're on those platforms or um, you know people have again a way to, to contact you but um, you know. It, and you can also, on the proactive side, reach out um, and, and find those opportunities or go to those agencies and, and say, hey, I just want to make sure I'm on your list. And, um, you know, uh, people do that to me all the time at Lionsgate. Like, you know, hey, saw you just join. Just want to make sure I'm on your contact list for screening invites and things like that. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then I made sure, like, we, it was added to the database. So, yeah. Do you think influencers need to understand marketing? Because it seems like we're putting these people in the path of stuff that might just be outside of their their wheelhouse, but we're at, expect like this conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, ultimately, they are a brand, right? right? And ultimately, they're marketing themselves. So you know, and so they're more savvy than I'm getting them credit for. They're already the good ones. Ones that are super successful really do understand this idea that they are a brand, they understand who their target audience is, they really truly understand the marketing principles and, and are really quite savvy at it. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, I read uh, in the New Yorker yesterday this long uh, profile of Ivan Schwinar, the founder of Patagonia, right? He does not use email and he does not use a cell phone. But he's such a brilliant marketer because he's out there with his customers every day. He's an expert at the product. He understands, like, he gets it, right? And so I think, and if you look at, like, kind of brand influencer people that you like, like, I'm a food guy, right? So I love Roy Choi and I love Anthony Bourdain. Those guys are really smart at media, really smart. Even though you don't necessarily think of them as marketers, they're really good at media. Yeah, I mean, I think that also, you know, sort of um, catching up and being savvy about the business side of things, you know, so when people say things like conversion and sell through and cost per convert, like understand all of that sort of econ stuff, you know, so that, that, because that's the business, in the end goal, all of this marketing, all this song and dance is for the, <laughs> the objective of selling products, so like whatever that product is. So, you know, kind of getting savvy in that world. Because um, in the end, even if you're you're working with an agency, the agency has to sell it back to the brand and the brand's goal and objective is sales. So, you know, understanding that aspect of it is just gonna help you. So that when they ask you questions or when you develop case studies, you can say, oh, well, hey, I worked on this project and it ended up increasing the sales up by 6%. Like, that is going to put you above and, uh, the rest of the people who come in the door. So, you know, coming and, and then going back to the agency and saying, can you give me some results of the campaign that I did with you so that I can use that for my next model? You might have to chase them for it, but, um, you know, put that in your contract too. Say, like, you know, at the end of it, I expect a full report on the campaign statistics so that I can incorporate into my case studies. Like, just make it part of the agreement. Are there pitfalls that that influencers can and should avoid relative to working with, with brands and like some things that have come to mind for me, like do they ever get put in the path of having to deal with customer like support things, their audience is like, asking them questions about the product or what if they make a mistake and say something <laughs> wrong and put their foot in the brand's mouth, like does that come up or have you seen any examples of that or anything that you would encourage an influencer just to watch it? There have been times where I've, where I've personally written something that they changed along the way, but they didn't give me that change. So they're like, we're not calling it this anymore, we're calling it this. So, I mean, they're very proactive about, hey, can you fix this? And yeah, of course. But I think it goes back to also about what um, your personality as a blogger on those online groups and what you're discussing, always be professional and yeah. And, and I, I think you have to, whether you're on the brand side or the influencer side, establish clear guidelines and boundaries up front so that everybody's expectations are clear on what yeah. your, uh, you know, 
what you're doing and what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. So if it's, you know, being as sort of as menial as even saying, you know, I'm going to include um, a link to your website and my Instagram homepage for 24 hours or whatever that may be. And, and honestly, a lot of that negotiation happens behind the door, too. Um, you know, and it's everyone has to get to a comfort level. So, you know, try to understand from the brand and agency side, we're paying you for exposure, and so that's going to be asked of. But <clears throat> just evaluate and see if it makes sense. And if it's start, if it if it's if they're they're wanting a lot out of you, and you just don't think it makes sense, or starting to get to a level of comfort, nip it in the butt there and say, you know what, no, I'm good, thank you. Um, but at the same time, as as you know, as as a brand, I've always um, I've, I've definitely written before and said, oh, you know. Because you are an influencer and you're writing things organically, this kind of tweaks a little bit, and is, the client's not going to be super happy about it. Would you mind changing it? Or hey, I so see you forgot to include the link to the website. Can you include the link to the website? Um, you know, we, we definitely you have that conversation, you have that ask, and it's just about everyone's comfort level. Can we talk a little bit more about the business side of influencer marketing? Because I, so you mentioned like a lot of the decisions are made behind closed doors. I'm sure some people watching this will want to know, well, how much can I earn? What are the, like some, you know, I heard PewDiePie made $14 million last year. And I suspect that that's the exception, not the rule. But can you talk about the range of what people are earning for what types of engagements? I mean, when I started, we didn't pay. Yeah, I mean, we didn't pay. We had an exchange system, right? It was like, I'm giving you content and exchange you're promoting for me. Yeah, and then now you have the tip of the iceberg, which is I'm making 50K, I'm making 100K, I'm making a million, whatever. Um, but again, I worry about those people that are at the tip of the iceberg because, again, I see those videos that are made for 50K and I go, Ugh. You know, so, so it's, you know, it might have, what I think is going to start to happen is the, um, that world, that sort of uh, Kardashian world-esque of the way things are happening, especially with the new guidelines, I think it's going to diminish. People are going to start to see through it. So I think it's just going to change. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's going to become something else where it's almost more of like, an actual commercial, you yeah. know, where and and less about you know um, trying to come across as something that's or, you know right. organic right. or authentic when it's not. Right. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting that um, I find it so ironic that Snapchat is now getting viewership numbers that's equivalent to television. Like it's just the second coming of television, you know. And there's no, there's no like engagement on, and engagement is seen as viewership. And so now it's like, okay, well, Snapchat is the next TV, and then the the content that's created on Snapchat is is different than a TV commercial. Yeah. But, yeah. And now that Instagram has Instagram Stories, it'll be super interesting to see what happens with Snapchat and whether or not that's going to, you know, affect, you know that audience, which, you know, I mean, I don't know, I think it's like something like 60% of millennials are, are on Snapchat right now. Yeah, and I would say it's an art and not a science, and it's very hard to evaluate ROI, like we yeah. talked about in there earlier, like, uh, you know, whenever I um, have tried to sell a brand on a particular channel, and this will monetize itself, I, I always lose, I always look like an idiot after that, because I promised them, and like, I think a brand has to look at like the 20 different consumer touch points and gee, how does it all add up at the end of the year? But if you looked individually at a Facebook campaign or if like, it yeah. wouldn't exactly monetize it. And it's interesting looking back on the last year, the influencer that I paid the most, I think, you know, it was a very, very interesting project that I'm, I'm proud of the work we did together. We did a huge co-creation project, but what I got back from them, I think was like, the least I've ever gotten from any, I, I don't think they, they barely lifted a finger for us, honestly, I feel like in a way. And so, you know, I agree that the, the best kind of relationships are where, you no, know, we're helping you and you're helping us and we're all in this together and we're rowing the same direction. We're not paying, it's not a transaction. Right. It's a mutually beneficial it's relationship. Partnership. It's a partnership. Yeah, I mean, look at like, you know, look at um, Red Bull and GoPro. I mean, like that partnership and relationship has been around forever, but it's just like the smartest merging of, and nobody's, I mean, it's a brand and a brand and they're all trying to generate sales. Like there's, we're not hiding it. 
but the end result that's coming out of it is just so smart and makes so much sense. Right, I call that a right size partnership. Like when Nike and Apple started working together on the first Nike Plus like 12 years ago, like that, that's a marriage made in heaven, Nike right. and Apple, right? right. So uh, those kind of partnerships, like finding the right level, the right size is the way to go. Yeah, I'd say newer bloggers can expect to maybe get a $50 gift card. Yeah, that's where it is turned around. Yeah. Um, and yeah. they can join networks such as Tap Influence, and it kind of aggregates what right. they, they kind of recommend you get paid, so maybe $350. Influential is another yeah. one. But, but again, it's be wary of it because it becomes very automated, and if all you have in your wheelhouse of case studies is like, I wrote a very formulaic product tweet and I got paid 50 bucks for it. Then when those big brands come and call in, you know, the Nikes of the world or the Apples of the world or, or whoever it may be, a, a creative focused um, brand, they're just gonna, you know, what do right. you have to show more? It's like in your Twitter feed when you see like a magazine has done a sponsored tweet and they say sponsored, you're like, that is bullshit, right? Like I just hate that. It just makes me lose trust, trust for that publication, right? Um, well, we have a couple more minutes. I wanted to uh, just open it up to you guys in the audience. I know um, my friend Brendan from Social Native is here. I'm sure you'll have something to add, but uh, you, you had a question, Miss? I did have a question. Um, unfortunately, you know, obviously the influencer body world has changed today, and I work on both sides, and um, at some point you have to give in. If you want the exposure, you're going to have to give in, right? So, um, for Latina Geeks, we do get paid for it. My co-founder, yeah. 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 So we do get paid for content, uh, but we don't work with any brands that we don't see a connection with. Right. And a lot of the times, at least the way we write our content, our, our um, readers are very appreciative mm -hmm. because we educate them, right? Mm -hmm. It's Latina Geeks technology, right? So we don't talk about Colgate or um, tampons or anything like Pampers. that, or Pampers. Um, but how do you, because you said, you know, you don't pay, but unfortunately that may change. How do you, how do you expect to stay um, competitive with other agencies that do? Because we can get paid anything between $300 to $5,000. I think you just have to show your results, right? So that's why it's important when you're working with that program, and even if it's a $50 gift card, you can say, all we got was a $50 gift card, and now with that we generated X, Y, Z. Um, so the more sort of that's going to build, you're going to build up, and you're going to build up, and you're you're just going to kind of have those case studies under your belt and, and showing success. It's the same thing as spending money on an ad. If we buy an ad buyer, we have expectations, right? We've seen in the past if we spend this much money on Facebook, we get this many click through, and but we'll, you know, we have sort of um, a uh, what I'm looking for, like a uh, a base point for, with which to work off of. Which we do, we do right. Offer. Right, so I think having the case study and having that sort of, so the, the, this is our expectations and this is what we think you're gonna get out of it, you also need to be savvy about that on the influencer side. But we generally, with our promoted posts, with contests with $50 gift cards, we see this. And then maybe that's even a conversation to say, that's not really enough. Like, this is what you're gonna get. If you're looking for more, my recommendation is that we do a co-sponsored video or something like that. Like, that's an opportunity for you to sell through a new opportunity. Um, so keep, get those analytics, get that case study for the good or for the bad, right? To say, hey, we've done it in the past, it hasn't really worked, this is what we generated. But now we've done something like a co-sponsored video and we get a thousand views and then we find that, um, you know, the traffic from that video ends up increasing twofold, whatever that may be. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to ROI. So, yeah. you know, ultimately, from a brand perspective, they're going to expect results on, they're going to expect a return on their investment. So if they're paying $5,000 to you, they're going to expect that in terms of sales. So from an influencer perspective, or obviously maybe more, right? They want a return on it. Um, so from an influencer perspective, having the case studies so that you can show what the results are from a previous campaign that is sort of like-minded or whatever, to be able to have proof of concept beforehand is really what's gonna be, because ultimately you also wanna protect yourself too, because you know the worst thing is to start to partner with folks to be able to garner like a $5,000 fee, not get the return on it, because then you start to create a bad name for yourself. So starting with the $50 gift certificate, 
getting the case studies, working up small, and then as you build your library um, and have proof of results, then you can have you know proof of the results. Good, good feedback, guys. I'm gonna uh, let Brendan have the last word as we wrap up. What do we miss? What do, what do you have to add? From, from I like what you guys said about um, mutually beneficial relationships with influencers, and I was wondering, do you have any success stories about? Uh, influencer content that you've reused or repurposed on your own platforms or your own properties and uh, what do you look for in, from the influencers that's, that says this is good enough I want to um, you know reuse this yeah. <laughs> um, I mean I think in the world so a lot of my background and experience is um, you know uh, uh, working with uh, video production content or, or co-created content or sort of thinking of the Red Bulls and the, the GoPros like series and contents and pieces of information is that um, I like to think of content creation of not just like a singular purpose and um, coming from the world of entertainment like if I had one three minute trailer I sliced and diced that trailer a million different ways um, and so it was you know if it was um, for example a particular actor that, that was going to promote it on their social channel channel, I slice up that trailer, so it mostly featured them. So um, in that world, if you're going to go through the effort of creating content, think about the many different ways in which you can slice and dice up that content that's going to be optimized for where you're placing it. So if it's for you and you are, you know, a, a food blogger, you're really going to talk about the food and your partnership and, and you as an individual, right? Because that's why people are following you. If it's the food partnership was with a, a new organic rice, like they're going to talk more about the rice, but why they partner up with you like it's going to be heavily weighted based on you know the platform and the information so think about the content and what you're creating all the different channels that it's going to go on and the messaging that's going to make the most sense for that channel yeah i agree with that totally i'm making a series of short films for ucla right now and from each short film we're doing like 10 or 15 different edits for every single plus behind the scenes for snapchat during the shoot everything and then at the same time, I'm working with the Malibu Marathon. Malibu Marathon, we're reinventing the event. And they have like no content. I mean like zero, nothing. So I'm going to my sort of running influencer friends and going, Billy, dude, what do you got? That video, great. I'm gonna take that YouTube video. Can I write a blog post interview with you? Like you just have to be scrappy. And there's an incredible amount of shareable content on YouTube and other places. Really interesting, great blog posts, millions of things. that. It's freely available to you, and you can put pretty good stuff together without making anything, if you have to. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. I could chat you guys up for another hour about this stuff. You've been great. Thank you, Cynthia, Thanks, Tanya, Peter, Jennifer. Thank you. you were great. Thanks so much.